the picture on the garment that you wear. Is it permissible to wear like a garment that has like a Michael Jordan symbol on it? Is that a picture? There's no eyes, there's no feet, there's just him. You guys know the symbol, right? Are you allowed to pray with that? Because I just said picture. Picture means, you know, you got to see like a real picture. Eyes, nose, face, everything. I mean, we're talking about a little Michael Jordan picture there, you know, just the symbol. You allowed to pray with that? No. Why? Because the rule is uh, anything that even represents a picture is also haram. See how it works? So even if you have a shadow of an image, like an animal or a real person, just the shadow alone becomes haram as well, okay? For, for the salah. You know the, um, the end one symbol as well? You know the end one? Product? There's this guy who's, who's, who also is holding a ball and he's running. Are you allowed to pray with that? No, why not? Because it represents a real person, right? So the same idea is given to anything. What if you have like a Nike symbol or a Reebok symbol? Are you allowed to play, uh, pray with those? Yeah, why? Yeah, it's not a picture of a, it's not a picture of a living thing. So now let's put it all together, guys. The ruling here is very simple. Anything that represents a living creature, either a human being or an animal, whether it's the creature itself or a shadow of that creature or an image of that creature, as long as it represents that creature, you try to cover it up when it's time to pray. My last question before we begin. Same thing along, along the same topic. What if you do have a Michael Jordan t-shirt on and you have the symbol, are you allowed to just take like a piece of tape or take a towel or something and just cover it up and pray? And then after you're done, then you can just remove it? Are you allowed to do that? Hmm? Is it covered when you do that? Yeah, it is. So you're allowed to? You're allowed to do it. Is it appropriate for the salah? Imagine you're standing in front of Allah and you're praying and you have this like towel or you have this garment, you have a piece of scotch tape there. I mean, does that look nice that, I mean, would you dress like that in front of an interview at work in front of your boss? You wouldn't do that, right? So you wouldn't want to do the same in front of Allah Azza wa Jal himself. Make sense? Yalla, let's begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Okay, so we are continuing our discussion of the أخطاء or the mistakes of those who pray, the مصلين and our last topic or subtopic that we looked at our last point was praying with pictures and uh, one question that came up after the discussion that we had was what if you have like a watch or a band and it also has an image or an actual picture let's say if you have a watch and in the watch itself there's a picture of like a dolphin or an animal or something in it are you allowed to pray with that watch Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah once gave a fatwa regarding this and he mentions that the issue here is is salah broken or nullified if you have pictures and you're wearing those pictures and you're praying with them is the salah nullified no it's not and we made this very clear in our first discussion that the salah is not broken because you have a picture on your, your, your garment. But the problem is, is that it distracts people around you and it most importantly it distracts yourself. Now is a tiny watch with a picture, an image of something going to distract you in salah? Not really. So Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah, and this is the opinion of the majority of scholars of Islam, is that it doesn't break the salah and it doesn't affect the salah in any way. So yes, it is permissible for you to wear, you know, small tiny things like a watch or a bracelet or something, and it might have an image on it. It's permissible, doesn't affect the salah really, but still brings us to the same point. Should you wear something like this when you stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal? And the answer is, uh, you know, you try to avoid it as best as you can, because you always want to maintain some level of purity and submission when you're praying towards Allah Azza wa Jal. 
The next error is uh, certain colors that are prohibited to wear in the salah. Now, the Prophet ﷺ mentions, and he tells this to us uh, after he saw one of the companions, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. Now, Abdullah ibn Umar, he was wearing a garment that was of a particular co color. Now, in the book here, it mentions like a saffron type of color. But this colored garment that he was wearing was like a bright orange. It was a bright orange type of color. And the Prophet ﷺ saw him wearing this color and told him, "Inna hadhihi min thiyab al kuffar, fala talbasha." This is one of the garments of the disbeliever, so don't ever wear it. Now here, the Prophet ﷺ is talking specifically about salah, because in the hadith itself, it mentions that the Prophet ﷺ saw him when he was going to pray. So it's important to know that wearing saffron colors or wearing a bright orange color is not haram. But it's one of the colors that is prohibited when it comes to the salah. The question here is why? What's wrong with wearing that color? Some of the ulama, they mention here, it's, it's basically mentioned in the hadith. Because it was a garment that the disbelievers used to wear, it's one of those things that you want to stay away from wearing simply because you don't want to look like someone else and then praying. So you don't want to look like you belong to another religion and then you're standing and you're praying Maghrib or you're praying Isha or something else. So the first type of color that's prohibited is a sort of a bright orange color. The second type is saffron colors itself. And that's based also on another hadith as well. The third color that's prohibited to wear in the salah is a bright red color, a bright red color. Now this bright red color is a color that is very, very obvious. It stands out more than anything else. Now don't look at the carpet and be like, well, look, the carpet's red. Like, what are we saying here? This is not what we're talking about. This brightest reddish color is a color that you rarely would see people wear simply because it stands out so much that you can actually see a person in an entire crowd of people. You can spot him out in, even if there's thousands of people there. You'll spot out this individual because of that red color. So this is like a bright neon type of color. Again, it's also prohibited for the same reason. This was one of the garments that some of the mushrikun used to wear during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So again, it brings us back to the same thing. Red is not haram to wear, but just in the salah, certain colors you should try to avoid. Let's summarize this before we get to the next point. This, the lesson behind the colors that you choose to wear is very simple. And that is, you choose colors that are not distracting to others, period. So use your common sense. Think about something that you wear that you know is not going to be distracting to others and that color, try to avoid wearing it. It doesn't matter what it is. So next point, next um, <coughs> error. The next error is very interesting. Um, it's not considered an error necessarily, but it's more of an etiquette that you should have. And that is wearing something on your head like the turban that the Prophet ﷺ would wear, or at least wearing what is considered to be a complete Muslim garment, whichever society you live in. So let me give you an example. In this society here in Toronto or in the West, if somebody prays without anything on their head, is that considered to be weird or abnormal? No, it's not. Not in our society because majority of people in this society don't wear anything on their head. So it's considered to be a complete norm in our society to do this. And the society and the culture will determine what you should wear and how you should wear it. However, if you go to another country, so let's say you go to like Pakistan, you go to uh, Saudi or you go to those Arab countries and you walk into the masjid and you don't have anything on your head. Is that considered to be something unusual or something out of the norm? Absolutely. Because for example, in Saudi, everybody wears the red and white shimaq 
or they wear the white one alone. Point is, they have something on their head. The religious people, the people who are devoted and they pray, they always dress with that complete attire. So what are you going to do when you go to those countries? You want to try to dress similar or at least like those people so at least you look similar and you fall into the culture naturally. Now the point here the author would like to make is very simple. Part of the etiquettes of prayer is that you should wear something that is considered to be appropriate for that salah. So like we talked about last week, wearing jeans wearing pants, wearing your, you know, gym shorts, all of these things you should try to avoid wearing them for the salah as much as you can. Come with the garment that's considered in our society to be a proper Muslim garment. So it could be something like what I'm wearing, it could be the, uh, the khamis that some of the other cultures wear. Whatever is considered to be generally an Islamic garment, that's what you should try to wear. As far as the women is concerned, now this is important. Should a woman always wear abaya when she's praying? Or can she allow to wear a skirt and a top as long as it covers her well? This is an issue here that scholars, they differ about. And they don't differ on the actual garment itself. But what they differ is, is how well that garment will cover you. So if a woman decides to wear a skirt and she wears a top, and that top covers her extremely well. You can't see nothing, you know, it's not transparent. You can't see, tell, you know, the shape of her or anything like that. So all of the conditions of the hijab have been met. Is she permitted to dress like this? Absolutely. But when it comes to the salah, it's different. When it comes to the salah, the Prophet wasallam always encouraged the women to always have at least one baggy garment to run over whatever they wear underneath. Even if it's a skirt and a top, at least one baggy garment should be over all of this. If they choose not to, can somebody say that your salah is incomplete? No. But this is again going towards the perfection and beauty and the manners that you have when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for the kids, don't come and pray in front of Allah and you're wearing your b-ball outfit. Don't come here and stand in front of Allah. Have some respect for yourself and have some respect when you stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal. Remember, this has nothing to do with mothers and fathers anymore. This is something that your parents also respect. Your mothers and fathers worship Allah Azza wa Jal. So you're not doing this for them. But you're doing this because you're scared that if you don't, Allah may punish you for it. So you come to the masjid and you stand in the congregation and you stand and you look appropriate like a proper Muslim. So you make sure that your hair is combed nicely if you're not wearing anything. And if you don't want to do that, then you wear a nice kufi on your head or something. Look like a good proper Muslim and have the best etiquettes when you stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal. Is that a deal? Deal. Good. Next uh, error, the next error, and by the way, the evidence for this of wearing something on your head or at least wearing a complete Muslim attire is that the Prophet وسلم, once mentioned, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَحَقُّ أَنْ يُتَزَيَّنَ لَهُ Allah Azza wa Jal has more right that you dress your best than anyone else. Allah Azza wa Jal has more right over you, so you should always try to dress your best when it comes to that. Next error, and that is, this is interesting. This next error is somebody feeling or telling others not to wear your shoes when it's time for salah. In other words, make sure that you never pray a prayer uh, if you have your shoes on. You should always take your shoes off regardless. This here is a mistake to believe that you're not allowed to pray with shoes on. It's actually against the sunnah. Because did the Prophet Sallallahu ever have carpet in his masjid? No. Did the companions during his time have carpet there? No, they didn't. They always wore sandals around their feet. And the sandals during that time, it was a piece of leather that was made from camel skin and it would have two straps on the top. And what they would do is that they would wrap their feet with these straps and that would be their shoes. And they would keep those same shoes on even whilst they were praying. 
with one condition. And that one condition is you make sure that they're always clean. You make sure that you didn't step in some mud or you didn't step in anything that was filthy. You always make sure that your shoes are clean. So the question arises is today, are we allowed to pray with our shoes on? Absolutely. Would you believe that some of the scholars of Islam even say that sometimes it is even mustahab to wear shoes on when you're praying? In other words, you should actually try to keep your shoes on when you have, whenever you have the opportunity and pray with them. And Shaykh Uthaymeen, he mentions a really interesting wisdom and he says, the reason why you should try to make yourself do that is so that you never forget that this was actually a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in the first place. Let me give you an example. You know, a long time ago, I went to a masjid just around the corner and it was Fajr time. And when I got there, the masjid was locked. So nobody came to open the masjid for Salatul Fajr. So eventually the rest of the brothers who pray Fajr, they also came. And uh, nobody came to open the masjid. So what did we have to do? It was time for Salah. We had to make a decision. So we decided we're going to pray right outside in the parking lot because we were already there. So they asked me to lead the Salah. So I said, okay, no problem. Now it's outside. We were on the pavement of the driveway. And so it was dusty, there were rocks everywhere. So I kept my shoes on. Majority of people behind me, they kept their shoes on as well. There was a couple people that decided to take their shoes off and I didn't have a problem with that. But one of those guys, one of those brothers had a problem with me. And what he did is when I stood up in the front and I'm ready to begin the salat, they gave the adhan, they gave the iqama. I stood up and I still had my shoes on and I said Staw and this one brother who took his shoes off he screamed at me and said take off your shoes this is not a park and I was just like what are you saying subhanallah so just to avoid any problem I took off my shoe right away because it's time for salah it's not the time to be like listen akhi you know the prophet it's not the time for that it's time for salah. So I took off my shoes right away. We prayed the salah and then I came up to the man after and I said, look, do you know how they used to pray during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And subhanAllah, the man says, I don't care. This is you, this is our, this is our etiquette. We have to make sure that we take off our shoes in front of Allah because our shoes walk all over the place. What's the problem that he's doing here? The problem is he doesn't know how to separate between a spiritual cleanliness as opposed to a physical cleanliness. Spiritually, you are pure and clean and you can pray in front of Allah. But physically, when you look at the shoe, yeah, you're not going to like, you know, take the, the bottom of the shoe and rub it or do anything with it. Yeah, of course it walked around here and there. But the problem is, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a samaha for this pardon this this type of filth or dirt whatever natural dust that's on your shoe it's naturally okay and it's actually considered to be pure are you allowed to make tayammum in the parking lot absolutely you're allowed to go out into that parking lot and find whatever natural dirt is there you don't go to a garden like the masjid or the pl people plant then no that dirt is not allowed to be used for tayammum but you can go outside and you find whatever natural dirt is there and you're allowed to pat it and make wudu with it. So that same dirt is predominantly what's under the shoe. So that's how you separate the two. Spiritually, you become in the state of cleanliness and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts this in the salah. So I hope that this point is clear. And like I said, this is the majority in terms of the manners of how the Prophet ﷺ would pray. So it's part of our aqidah that we believe we are permitted to pray when it comes to the salah with our shoes on. Now in terms of how do you make wudu with shoes on and things like that, we discussed this already when we did our session in, of the fiqh of wudu. Next error. The next error is uh, um, the salah in places that have pictures or praying on top of a garment that also has a picture or any other place that might have pictures around you. So for example, imagine you have a room and there's a picture of uh, your mom or your dad or somebody, you know, in a nice frame and it's hung up against the wall. Are you allowed to pray in that room? Well, the question here is, forget the prayer for a moment. 
are you allowed to hang a picture on the wall in the first place? And the answer is no. According to the majority of ulama, the answer is no. Why? Number one, Aisha radiallahu anha, she had a curtain that would separate her home from the neighbor's house behind her. And that curtain had some images. And I don't know what the image, the hadith doesn't mention what the images were. But they were pictures of something. And the Prophet sallallahu told her to remove those curtains. Change them and put something else there. And she did that. A second narration, Aisha radiallahu anha had some pillows or had some garments on, uh, on a sitting area in the house of the Prophet sallallahu and the Prophet ﷺ came home one day and he stood by the entrance of his home and his face turned all red. He's really mad because he's so upset of what he's seeing that the, that garment that she laid out to sit on, she laid it out there and it also had pictures on it. And she, she said, I understood right away from how red his face became that it was this pictures that was making him upset. So she took the garment and she made pillows out of it and she kept them. Now, this is interesting because that also raises another issue. Are you allowed to have pillows and things that have like little pictures on them? Would you believe it? That you, because of this narration, scholars differ on this issue. Many scholars permitted this. So if you have a pillow and the pillowcase is like, you know, some Winnie the Pooh or something, right? You're allowed to use those things and you're allowed to sleep on them and you're allowed to have them according to how this narration is understood. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But going back to praying in these areas, the answer here is you try to avoid this as much as possible. Why? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told his wife Aisha radiallahu anha, remove these pictures and remove these garments away from me for verily they distract me whilst I'm praying. Now, so if you have these pictures around, then you also want to make sure that these pictures, first of all, if they're hanging up on a wall, you want to remove them simply because in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that angels will not enter a home that pictures are hung and displayed for viewing. Angels will not enter this home. And you always want to have angels in your home. The reason why is because angels, part of their duties is that they protect us. They make sure that the livelihood of us in our homes is protected and they will also protect shayateen and jinn depending on the circumstance from entering those homes as well. So you always want the angels to be there and to protect us. So that's important. Next error. Um, uh, sorry, the next point in the same error. Prayer mats. You ever notice today what people, what people have for prayer mats? You know how a lot of people, they'll have like the picture of the Kaaba on the prayer mat or they'll have the picture of the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid and all those different things. Well, this is not haram. This is one thing I want to make sure that's clear. But there's a problem with this. Because what happens is that you'll be sitting there and you'll be praying and you'll lose every focus you have in the salah, at least the majority of it. Anybody who prays on this kind of prayer mat, you cannot say that this is not true. It's only natural that this will happen to you. We're human beings. The littlest things can distract us. And so if you have these prayer mats, now one of the reasons why these things are made, even in the first place, it's because it's a business, right? It's a profitable business. People love the Kaaba. People love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's mosque. And people will do anything to, to have at least some sort of token that reflects that. I remember in, in Saudi, uh, during Hajj time, a man took off his scarf and he had a bowl of zamzam and he dipped it inside the zamzam and then he wrapped the scarf up he didn't like you know wring it out so the water would come out like as if he was washing it he wrapped the zamzam uh, cloth and he put it in a bag and he tied it so i couldn't i couldn't help right and so i asked the man like what are you doing and he says you know how much i can sell this for when i go back to my country you know subhanallah all he has to do is go back to his country and say that he has a garment that was dipped in zamzam water and people will just fork out every ounce of wealth they have and buy it because they think there's some barakah behind it. So the same idea with this. I remember even one sister told me that sometimes when she sees the Kaaba and she was so polite and so jolly about it. She says, you know, whenever I have the prayer mat in front of me and I see the Kaaba and I see all the people around the Kaaba there, 
I feel like I'm praying in the haram when I'm praying on this prayer mat. You know, that's a pretty sad thing to feel. Because you're sitting there in your house in Toronto or something, and you have this prayer mat, and you're like, I feel like I'm in Mecca right now. So that's not the point, right? You don't want that to happen. You got to stay focused. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, you're standing in front of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So those kind of prayer mats, again, you try to get something simple and something plain. They're very easy to get now. Next error, and this is the one um, that we want to discuss, um, inshallah, and that is prayer on a grave or towards a grave. Now, the Prophet ﷺ said just before he died, now listen to this hadith, how interesting it is. This is an authentic hadith that he mentions. The Prophet ﷺ says before he died, verily I am the one who is most deserving of having a friend. This is the first thing he says. But Allah Azza wa Jal took me as his friend, just like how he took the Prophet Ibrahim as his friend. Now you know the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran um, that he's taken Ibrahim a khalila, he's taken Ibrahim as his friend. Can you imagine Allah is your friend? Yeah, who's your friend? Allah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like one of the most amazing profound things that you can't even you can't even really swallow you can't even really taste what that feels like that Allah has accepted you as his friend and so he accepts Ibrahim and he accepts the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as his friend hadith continues he says if i were to take a close friend in this world it would be who do, who is the person Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu every time they would walk, you know what they would do? They'd hold hands like this. Now imagine if you were to hold each other's hand right now, what would happen, you know? I can already see the facial expression, like, A'udhu Billah, right? Why would you do that? That's actually an Islamic etiquette that's very praised in our religion. I even remember the first time I was walking in Medina, and I was walking with a sheikh, and I was so happy to be beside the sheikh, until he grabbed my hand. And when he held my hand, I was just like, you know, I'm from the West, you know, and he's from there. So people who touch our hand, especially from the same gender, it's like a very uncomfortable feeling. But eventually, when I started to learn about the beauty behind this and the brotherhood that it builds, wallahi, it's something from my heart. I wish that the Muslim culture could readapt once again. I wish insha'Allah ta'ala that we would have that again because by simply being able to put two hands together with nothing else attached except hubbun lillah except for the love of Allah azza wa jal really cre creates a strong bond support for each other. So we ask Allah azza wa jal insha'Allah to preserve that love between each and every one of us. The hadith continues. Then the Prophet sallallahu says, Verily the people who came before you, they used to take graves and they would build mosques and masajid over them. And he tells the, the people, don't take my grave as a masjid or don't build a masjid around it or over it. For verily I prohibit you from doing that. And as a matter of fact, there is probably a half a dozen hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu saying this before he died. Imagine how many times he's telling the companions, don't take my grave as a masjid, don't build a masjid around me, don't do this and don't do that. So that brings us to the question now. The question here, here is, how do you explain today's masjid and nabawi of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Now here's the thing couple things you want to understand. Number one, this expansion that you see today that envelops the graves of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, this wasn't there during his time. This actually happened more than a hundred years after he died. More than a hundred years after he died, the haram started to expand. And the Khalifa during that time was... Uh, supporting the fact that the expansion would envelop the graves of the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions. He supported that. He wasn't a very religious Khalifa during that time. But the scholars who were living in Medina, they were against it. They spoke against it. You can see in the history books, they talked about this as well. 
They spoke against this and they tried their very best to stop that ex expansion from including the graves. But what, for whatever reason, for political reason, for power or whatever it was, the expansion went through. And so as a result, what happened is today's expansion that you see started to include the Prophet Wasallam's graves and his companions as well. Then this here, another issue that also um, came up was how would the government and the authorities and all the nations that came after that period, how would they deal with this problem? So I wish I had like a board here. I would have drawn out for you how the Prophet ﷺ is buried and how he is sitting or, or, or how he's laid out beside Abu Bakr and Umar. Because basically how it is is that imagine that this book here is the grave. The Prophet ﷺ is like this. And his head, let's put it this way. This is the head, the top of my pen, and this is his feet. So he's sitting, he, he's laid down like this and he's facing towards the Qibla. Then you have Abu Bakr, now look where the pen is. Then you have Abu Bakr beneath him. Then you have Umar ibn al-Khattab here. They're not sitting like this. They're not sitting like how a lot of people think they're, they're side by side. You have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, then you have Abu Bakr immediately beside him. That's not how they are. It's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi here, then it's sort of like a staircase effect. You have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then slightly towards the right you have Abu Bakr, then slightly below you have Umar ibn al-Khattab. And they're all within the same area. Now if you go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's masjid, what you're gonna see are three doors. A lot of people think, the Prophet's here, Abu Bakr is here, and Umar is here. No, that's not correct. They are all in the center area, or the center doors that you see. Everybody's seen those beautiful gold doors that you, you see like thousands of pictures of them? Well, they are in the center of that area. And Alhamdulillah today, the, the, the people who are in charge there, the authorities, there's actually a sign there that tells you that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is here and Abu Bakr and Umar ibn Khattab, they're all in that middle area of the grave itself. So there's a dilemma now. How did they work around this whole issue? They worked around it by building these triangle walls deep within the ground, hundreds of feet into the ground. These triangle walls are actually computer and electronically monitored. I had a privilege of doing something that I'm sure none of you here have, have had. And anybody who's gone to Mecca, uh, sorry, gone to Medina, I'm sure you didn't get this opportunity to do this. But I had the opportunity to going underneath the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu to see how all the mechanics of how things work. Underneath the Masjid itself is a whole different world. It's actually offices, there are computer and technical rooms there. There are, you know, massive pipes. We all know that the water that filtrates the AC system in the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid actually comes from more than one kilometer away from the Masjid. And it's filtered and it's run through into the Haram. So I got a chance to take a tour. It was myself and the classroom. We got a chance to go underneath. We got a chance to push the button to turn on the microphone. We got a chance to play and close and open the roofs. And then we also got a chance to see this area where it was like a massive computer room. And the men said to us, this here is to control the wall that's built around the grave of the Prophet Wasallam. Because you know what happened one time, right? A long time ago in our history, there was a munafiq or a hypocrite that came to Medina and he wanted to dig a hole and get to the body of the Prophet ﷺ. And so what happened is he started digging a hole. And for months he was there in Medina. For months and months. And the companions eventually caught him. Eventually caught what he was doing. And he dug a tunnel. And they said that if we gave him one more day to dig, he would have reached the body of the Prophet ﷺ. So because of that, the government eventually sealed that area and they built these massive metal walls. There's a couple of them. There's not just one. There's a series of them that now are electronically monitored in case anybody tries to dig underground one more time. 
So that's that in terms of praying on a qabr. Now in terms of praying on top of the grave, not only is it prohibited, but the salah itself, it doesn't count. Unfortunately, a lot of countries around the world do this. I have visited some of these countries where inside the masjid itself, you can literally see there's a big massive grave right there and people are praying towards it. Or I remember one masjid I went into, there was a grave right in the center of the prayer area. So imagine if you walk into a masjid like this and there's a big grave right there and people are praying all around it and that's how they're praying. So of course this year, the Prophet wasallam prohibited this at all levels. The question here is, why? What's the problem with that? I hope that the, the answer to this question is very obvious. The problem with it is because of anybody raising the status of those individuals who died. Praising them, elevating them to more than what they were, which was just human beings. We live in a time where, where our societies encourage this. Let me give you an example. When MJ retired, guys, when he retired, what did they do? What did they build for him outside of the United Center, outside of the basketball stadium? They built a statue for him. Why? It was all because of, now just think about it, what it does for youth when they see this. For some, for some youth now, they want to make uh, a special trip. It's almost as if they're going for Hajj to Chicago to see the statue of MJ outside the United Center. And they want to take pictures and they want to be there. Now visiting it is no problem. I'm just talking about the psychological effect that it has on our youth today when they see that. They start to elevate and praise. You know, they say things like, well, billah, this is the God of basketball. And if some of his teammates actually titled him as that. And so you see, they just fed off of that phenomenon and they built the statue. Magic Johnson also has one as well. And other players also has one as well. Where's all of this coming from? This all the Prophet wasallam prohibited during his time. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal of course to protect our youth and to protect our children from this. Allahumma ameen. Let's just take one more inshaAllah before we pause for uh, today. The next error is... Uh, Choosing your spot or claiming your own spot in the masjid for prayer. Claiming your own prayer spot in the masjid. In other words, every time somebody walks into the masjid, they're always going to pray at the exact same spot every single salah. Now this is a huge problem. For one, the Prophet ﷺ prohibited this. And he said... To, don't have, don't go and choose a spot that you'll always be praying in the masjid because you're going to imitate the camel and how the camel walks into its, um, its pen or its area. The camel, what it does is it chooses an area that it'll sit. It chooses an area that it'll eat. It'll choose an area where it'll sit and it'll sleep. It'll do everything. And that becomes its spot. It never changes its spot. That's theirs. As a matter of fact, even there are like, I remember, you know, we used to hear about this in Medina, that some camels will get mentally insane if you move them away from their spot. They'd get like mentally crazy, they'll fight, they'll try to, you know, hurt their owners and things like that. So the Prophet says, don't do what the camel does, don't imitate it. Now the question here is, now listen to this. There's another narration of a companion by the name of Salma ibn al a core. His, uh, uh, his, his title that he's mostly known for was Abu Muslim. His name was Abu Muslim. Now look what Abu Muslim used to do. Abu Muslim used to pray beside a pillar. See these pillars that we have in the masjid? There was one like this in the Prophet's mosque. This pillar was called the Istiwanatul Muhajirin. It was the pillar of the Muhajirin. The reason why it was called that is that's the pillar where the Quraysh, when they accepted Islam, they would make hijrah from Mecca to Medina and they would always gather and sit against this one pillar. Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he says that this pillar was actually in the center of the garden of the Prophet You know the rawda in the masjid itself, that garden area. He said that this pillar was actually in the center of that garden that where they used to sit. 
And Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that we never knew where this pillar was. We never could find where this place was. But if we did find it, what we would have done was we, we would have taken an arrow and we would have marked that spot. So people would know that this was a place the Prophet Sallallahu used to be at and used to gather. Now this one companion here, he always used to pray there. So, you know, a companion came up to him and said, Ya Aba Muslim, O oh Abu Muslim, I see you, you're always praying in this one pillar area. Why do you do that? And he says, فَإِنِّي رَأَيْتُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ Verily, I saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم يَتَحَرَّ الصَّلَاةَ عِنْدَهَا He used to always sit here and he used to always pray his prayers near this particular pillar. Now, here's the point. First point that you want to make sure you understand. This companion, listen to his words. He says, فَإِنِّي رَأَيْتُ I seen him do this. So if he didn't see the Prophet ﷺ do it, would he have done it? No. So that's the first point. He actually saw with his own eyes the Prophet ﷺ always praying in this area. So he imitated that. Is that permissible? Of course it is. Not only is it permissible, but it's recommended to do that. So that's the first point. Um, the second point here now is, aside from all of this, now remember we have the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, don't be like the camel, but then you have this here, where this companion did it all the time. How do you put the two together? Very simple. If one is confirmed and you saw the Prophet ﷺ, that's a lot different than just doing it out of speculation, or just doing it as a habit. You saw the Prophet ﷺ doing this, so then you can do it. It's just like what Umar ibn al-Khattab said to the black stone. That's on the Kaaba. He looked at the black stone and he said, Wallahi, if I didn't see the Prophet ﷺ kiss you, I would never ever touch you. I would never even kiss you. But because he saw the Prophet ﷺ kissing the stone, he decided to do it as well. So the same idea here. Now, here's the question, guys. And this is what we're going to conclude with, inshaAllah. What's the problem with choosing a spot to pray in the masjid? Like, is it really that bad? Suppose I like the corner area and I like to pray there. What's wrong if I just go there and I pray every single salah there? Suppose I like that particular spot right there. What's wrong if every single time I come there and I just pray there? Well, there's a couple of issues. Number one is um, the Prophet wasallam. As a matter of fact, Allah Azza wa Jal Himself says in the Quran, the ard the ground that you worship Allah Azza wa Jal upon is going to testify for you on Yawm al Qiyamah. So the ground is going to be told to speak and say, Ya Rabb, he used to walk on me and he used to do this and that. Ya Rabb, he used to stand on me and he used to pray. So some of the ulama, they said, the wisdom behind choosing different spots to pray is that you can have more of Allah's ground, more of the earth to testify for you on Yawm Al Qiyamah. Isn't that like a beautiful wisdom? So SubhanAllah, great hikmah behind it. Second issue with it. Now this is the problem. Now imagine if you come to one spot and you get used to that spot. What are you going to think that spot does for you? You're going to feel like the spot is like, this is your special spot now. This is your barakah spot, you know? You can have your khushur in this spot. Your khushur doesn't come out unless you pray right there. So what happens is that you sentimentally attached yourself now to this one spot and you can't break away from it. That's a huge problem. As a matter of fact, that's a, that's a level of minor shirk because you're placing barakah in something that in and of itself doesn't have barakah. Only Allah Azza wa Jal can do that. Third issue is it resembles the behavior of animals, including the camel, as we just talked about. So you don't want to resemble an animal in any way, shape, or form. The next thing is, the next problem is, is that a person may eventually claim ownership for that spot. You know, when I used to go to the Haram in Medina, I always used to like to get the, um, I, I like to call it in my head, it's courtside seats, right? It's basically you're praying in the front row behind Hudayfi, behind at that time, you know, Sheikh Maher, Mu'ayqli, Sheikh Budair, you know. You want to get courtside seats and you want to pray right behind these individuals. There's only one problem. The guy who prays right behind him, 
not only did he reserve that spot all by himself, but he put these like barriers, he put these Quran stands, he put like seven different carpets there, he put like this tape, like he put so many things that that was his spot. And if you came there, subhanAllah, let me tell you, I saw this with my own eyes. One brother, he asked the police officer that was there, like you know the imams, they have security. So he asked the police officer, is this spot reserved for anyone? And the police officer said, no, those two spots are for the authorities behind the imam, but everything else there is for anybody to sit. So I asked, you know, the, the man asked the person, so why do, are people like reserve these spots? And he goes, he doesn't know, they just wanna be close, they wanna pretend they're important or something, right? So the man said, okay, fine, I'm gonna pray here. He removes all that carpet and all that tape and everything, and he starts to pray there. I saw this with my own eyes. The guy who basically claimed that spot, he came and he saw the man praying there. Would you believe he stood in front of him and he broke his salah and he said, Hada makani, you know, this is my spot. And he sat there and he prayed. And subhanAllah, the brother is actually praying and he got pushed out of his position and he claimed the ownership in that spot. That's why you don't choose a spot and claim it as yours in any masjid. And as a matter of fact, I remember even Sheikh Mukhtar al-Shanqiti Hafizahullah spoke against this and said this is against the Sharia to claim your own spots in the masajid and persons should try not to do that. So those are some of the problematic issues when it comes to praying in the same spot. So do yourself a favor and try your very best to always you know, look around in the masjid and try to enjoy every part of the masjid for inshallah that part will testify for you on yawm al-qiyamah bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Last final point, going back to that narration of Abu Muslim, some of the ulama said it's not the fard salah that he used to do this. The Prophet ﷺ used to pray by this pillar only for his sunnah prayers. So only for the sunnahs after um, his fard and his, um, uh, what is it called, the tahajjud that he would pray during the night. This is where he would do it. Otherwise, when it came to the fard salah, the only person that's allowed to choose a spot to pray, who is it? It's the person who stands right here. It's the imam. He's the only person that's allowed to claim a position, claim a spot, and that spot belongs and it's reserved just for him. So having said that, brothers and sisters, inshallah in our next class or next uh, session, we will talk about the sutra or the barrier that is, is, is reserved for you. So to have something in front of you and pray towards it, we'll talk about that. And then we're going to get into the salah itself. The mistakes that people make when they stand in prayer, mistakes in the rukur, mistakes in the sujood, mistakes in the sitting position and the tashahud and the taslim, and many, many other mistakes, inshallah, we will continue, and this will happen in our next session. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us perfect our salawat, to help us perfect our qiyam, our rukur, our sujood, and everything about the salah, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept it from us. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kids, kids, I want you all to stay here. I want to speak to you guys. All the kids at the door, come right back. We're looking at you. Come right back, please. Come right back, all of you. I'm gonna. Uh, this is not for the mic. I'm gonna come to you guys, okay?